Now that we know the definition of average total cost, average variable cost, and marginal cost, we can derive the general shapes of what we call the cost curves of the firm. A cost curve always has output on the horizontal axis and dollars on the vertical, because we're trying to illustrate how the costs measured in dollars change as output changes. So let's start with the average total cost. If we look at this average total cost column, we see it starts high, it falls, and eventually it rises again. So at least for a firm that has costs that can be described by a table like this, we start with a high average total cost. It falls as we produce this more, but eventually it starts rising again. Now suppose the firm is producing this much output. We can use the average total cost curve to read off what the average total cost for that firm is given it's producing that much. It's this vertical distance. And the total cost is just the average total cost times output. We can just take the equation that's the definition of an average total cost, multiply through by x, and we get this equation. So the average total cost times the amount of output we're producing gives us this vertical distance times this horizontal distance, which gives us the area of a rectangle. That rectangle is the total cost the firm incurs if it's producing this much output. We can do something similar for variable costs. So again, in the graph with output on the horizontal axis, dollars on the vertical, we can draw our average variable cost curve. And again, we see it starts high, it falls, and eventually it rises again. So we again get something like a U-shape. Now, if the firm's producing this much output, we use the average variable cost curve to find out what the average variable cost for that firm was. It's that vertical distance. The variable cost is equal to the average variable cost times output. Again, we just multiply through by x to get from this equation to this equation. So here we have our average variable cost. Here we have our output level. This distance times this distance gives us this rectangle, which is now the variable cost. So the two pictures look almost identical, except they use a different cost curve, the average total cost versus the average variable cost. So in this case, the rectangle becomes the total cost. In this case, it becomes the variable cost. Next, we can ask, well, What's the relationship between those two curves if we put them on a single picture? So if we draw a single picture with output on the horizontal, dollars on the vertical, we can start with the average variable cost curve. And then we can see where does the average total cost curve lie relative to that. Well, total costs include fixed costs, so the average total cost should lie above the average variable cost. For Producing only a single unit, it lies above by 90, which is exactly our fixed cost. And that makes sense. The difference between total cost and variable cost is fixed cost. So the difference between average total cost and average variable cost is average fixed cost. But if we are only producing a single unit, then the average fixed cost is equal to the fixed cost because we're just dividing by one. So we begin with a big difference, the entire fixed cost. But what if we produce two units? If we produce two units, the difference between the average total cost and the average variable cost has shrunk to 45, half the fixed cost. Because the difference between average total cost and average variable cost is average fixed cost, and when we're producing two units, the average fixed cost is only half of the fixed cost. And if we go to three units, the difference shrinks to 30, which is a third of the fixed cost. So for the second unit, it's half the fixed cost. For the third unit, it's a third of the fixed cost. So you can see that that average total cost curve gets closer and closer to the average variable cost curve and eventually converges. The average fixed cost of a single unit is the fixed cost. The average fixed cost of a million units is the fixed cost divided by a million which is a very tiny quantity. And so at large quantities, the average total cost curve 
becomes very close to the average variable cost curve. Finally, we can ask, where does the marginal cost curve lie in this picture? So if we look at the two columns, we see that the marginal cost is equal to the average variable cost for the first unit. And that's no accident. Marginal costs, by definition, only include variable costs. There are the additional costs from producing one more unit, which never includes a fixed cost. If we're producing a single unit, then the marginal cost of the first unit is just the variable cost of that first unit. And the average variable cost is also the variable cost for the first unit, because when we take the average, but we're only producing a single unit, we're only dividing by one. So it has to be logically the case that for the first unit, the marginal cost and the average variable cost are exactly identical. Then we see the marginal cost lying below the average variable cost for a while until it lies above the average variable cost. So we see something where initially the marginal cost lies below the average variable cost, but eventually it lies above. And I've drawn this with the marginal cost crossing the average cost curves, both the average variable and the average total cost curves, at their lowest point. That is not an assumption. That too is a logical implication of the definition of these curves. And to see the intuition behind it, let me take you to an example that you're very familiar with. Suppose you've taken a bunch of exams in the class and you now have an average score. What's the only way for that average score to go up? Well, the next exam has to be above the average to drag the average up. What's the only way for the average to go down? Well, the next exam has to have a score below the average to drag the average down. The next exam is your marginal exam. So the only way that your average grade goes up is if your marginal exam grade lies above the average, and the only way it goes down is if your average, if your marginal exam grade lies below the average exam grade. The same for average costs and marginal costs. The only way an average cost can be falling is if the marginal cost lies below it. The only way it can be rising is if the marginal cost lies above it. And that's true for any average curve. So that's why the marginal cost curve not only starts at the same point as the average variable cost, but it lies below the average cost curves until the lowest point of the average cost curve where the marginal cost curve must cross. So now we have a marginal cost curve. which we can isolate by itself, that also has a U-shape. This tells us that initially it's getting easy and easy to produce. Initially, the additional cost for producing more goods is smaller and smaller and smaller. But eventually, the additional cost of producing an additional unit gets larger and larger and larger. Eventually, it gets harder and harder to produce. And this is a feature of many real-world production processes. So in, you can think back to, your, to the example of the restaurant. When you produce only a single meal for a single customer, you only need one worker. That worker can greet the customer, can take the order, can cook the meal, can bring the meal, and eventually can clean up after the customer leaves. But the more customers you serve, the more workers you're going to hire, and they're going to get more specialized jobs. There'll be a waiter and a cook and so forth. And through that specialization, we can get more cost effective. So initially, as we grow the business, our marginal cost is falling because we're harnessing the power of specialization. But eventually, you have someone fulfilling every role in the, house, in the restaurant, and you can't get any more power from specializing anymore. And in a limited restaurant space, as the restaurant gets crowded, your workers are going to start running into each other, interfering with each other. And so each additional customer that you serve will now cost you more than the previous customer. So that's the general logic behind that shape that gives us the U-shaped marginal cost curve, which also gives us the U-shaped average variable cost curve and average total cost curve.
Now one final thing about the marginal cost curve. If you produce a certain level of the output, when we go up to the marginal cost curve, that tells us the additional cost of the last unit that we produced. It doesn't tell us the average for every unit that we produced, as was the case in these initial graphs. It just tells us the additional cost from the last unit. To figure out what the total variable cost is, we would have to figure out, well, what was the variable cost of the first unit? What's the additional variable cost, which is the marginal cost, of the second unit? What's the additional cost of the third unit and of the fourth unit, and so on and so forth? We'd have to add up all of these marginal costs. And if we add up all of those marginal costs, that should be equal to our variable cost, just as it was the case if we multiply average variable cost times output, that that gives us variable cost. So this area should be exactly equal to that area, but it's measured on a different curve. It is, for those of you who enjoy calculus, the integral of the marginal cost curve.